For over a decade with the firm, Ms. Varma specializes in power and aviation sector. She has led, she has a lead role in the aviation practice of the firm while spearheading JSA's civil aviation practice. She's a litigator who covers the entire spectrum of advisory, risk analysis, and arguing matters before specialized commissions, tribunals, various high courts, and the Supreme Court of India. She has been consistently advising and representing Federation of Indian Airlines and Inter-Air Transport Association amongst individual airlines on legislative, policy, and regulatory issues. Ms. Varma is a, is a regular participant and speaker in the nationwide conferences conducted by the Center for Aviation, the Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industry, the Confederation of Indian, uh, Indian Industry on Energy and Aviation Sector and the related issues. We welcome you, ma'am. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Salim. It's Thank absolute you. honor to be here with you all. I know it was uh, being planned for a while now. I'm sorry I was not able to take out time at that stage. But now with uh, lockdown all across, we have the liberty and the leisure of making ourselves available to all the students. Thank you, Dr. Selim. Thank you, Ritum, for the introduction, for your kind introduction. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. All the students who are attending this uh, session, thank you for taking the time out on a Friday evening. I would not want to take too much time on the technicalities of the sector. What I'm going to cover here is a very basic issue or the concept uh, scenario of the aviation sector. I will tell you briefly how it works, who are the stakeholders in the industry, uh, who is the regulator of the sector, how does it function, what are the difficulties being faced by various stakeholders in the sector? So it will be a very basic kind of a session. In case any of you would want to have any further detailed discussion or you would want to have an understanding of any aspect which I would cover, please feel free to write to me or you can also ask me if you want in this session only to explain anything. So with that, I would like to start this. So this is what I said, this is broadly what I'm going to cover very briefly. It may look a lot, but uh, it will be a simple uh, presentation. So uh, Indian aviation sector, we've been hearing a lot of good things in the last five years. We were the third largest uh, growing sectors in the world. And why we say so? Because the progression in the last five years has been tremendous. We were growing at the pace of about 70 to 80% per annum. The number of uh, passengers traveling all across, domestic as well as international, was more than what was internationally uh, noticed. In fact, this uh, International Air Transport Association which takes care of all the data worldwide, said that we would be the largest uh, aviation market by 2026. But with this pandemic now uh, in our face, we don't know whether we will be actually uh, achieve that target or not. But let's see, hope sustains life, as they say. So uh, beginning about the airports and how, uh, we work in India. We have about 486 airports and airstrips. Some of them are uh, defense controlled, some of them are privately controlled, and some of them are privately and publicly controlled uh, airports, which essentially would mean that some are totally under the control of the government, some are privately owned by uh, the industries, and others by a joint control. You must have heard a concept of private public participation, PPP. So this is what it is. I will talk about PPP a little later when we come to Delhi Bombay examples, which are huge examples, which are quoted worldwide when we talk about Indian aviation. So uh, we have 486 airports. And as of 2020, we have about 91 international carriers comprising five Indian carriers and 86 foreign carriers. That's a huge number in our list. Fortunately, uh, 
some german and polish airlines and some canadian airlines recently have started their operations in india unfortunately at the same time that the covid 19 has happened and they will have they had to stop their operations which is going to impact them badly but the good news was that all the international carriers are looking at indian aviation market very very positively so aviation market is a regulated uh, sector i am not sure how many of you are actually aware what is a regulated sector how many regulated sectors we have in india so that's a very broad uh, frame framework to say that it's a regulated sector there are many other sectors which are regulated within infrastructure when we say if you subdivide it then most infrastructure sectors come within regulated areas so aviation is regulated which means even uh, when you want to start an airline when you want to start an airport anywhere in the country you have certain regulations in place which need to be fulfilled which need to be complied with for any player whether private or even government particular state government if they want to do something about it then they have to comply with the regulations in place that's why this sector is called regulated sector and highly regulated since it's regulated i must then uh, cover briefly which are the government bodies which control this sector biggest overarching uh, authority is the ministry of civil aviation which controls every authority which will come under it which i have mentioned here in my slide you may see that within ministry of civil aviation you have all these 1 2 3 4 5 5 authorities we have director general of civil aviation which is primarily looking into the safety and uh, supervision of all the airlines whether an airline can uh, fly not fly what time can a pilot reach the airplane etc everything is being uh, overseen by dgca in the recent uh, past two two months back and onwards you must have noticed that dgca has played a very active role in uh, controlling the situation as far as flights were concerned domestically or internationally then you have another authority called airports authority of india that's also responsible for the airports that has nothing to do with the airlines that is responsible for the airports bureau of civil aviation security is again for airline operators primarily but it also has a very slight role for the airports then you have a regulator called airports economic regulatory authority it is a statutory authority which essentially means that uh, how the tariff of airports is determined is going to be determined by this regulator called era he also uh, enforces several standards that are required to be performed by the airports they essentially control the airports not the airlines because airline business is market driven it is not controlled by any authority then we have an appellate authority currently tdsat which is telecom dispute settlement and appellate authority they are performing this role of airports tribunal otherwise uh, there is a need to have a separate appeal tribunal currently we don't have it so that td sat is performing a dual role of td sat versus era so with these authorities the aviation sector is being uh, governed now the regulatory framework how do we uh, govern these airports and the airlines we have domestic laws in place as i said here legislations and delegated legislations there are benchmark policies issued by ministry of civil aviation from time to time there are international conventions which are ratified by india and those also set some grounds uh, for us to know as to why and how uh, some international airlines and airports have been working throughout the world now it's briefly setting out what are domestic laws what do they govern 
I am not going to touch upon each and every uh, legislation here because the, it is never ending. I will just start from the beginning because the story started in 1934, which was the primary domestic legislation. One of the first legislation, though there was two before this also, but this was the major uh, change in our uh, country, which governed the Indian Air Force. After that, from 1934, the next uh, statute that was brought in was only in 1994. And that was Airports Authority of India Act. Before that, you will notice in 34, it was only aircraft. So the aircrafts were coming into the country, they were flying within the country, but there was no clarity. There was nothing to govern the airports as such. So therefore a need was felt by the government to have Airports Authority of India Act 1994. This essentially uh, culminated the two authorities of national uh, authority and international authority, which were performing separate roles independently. The government thought that we should have one authority which will lay the ground for both. So that's how Airports Authority of India Act came in into play. It has been revised several, amended several times since then. 2004 saw a very important change from a uh, liberalization uh, perspective. They added a clause which has helped in promoting PPP. This led to several uh, PPP projects being uh, uh, performed in the aviation sector. The landmark is Delhi and Bombay uh, airport, followed by Bangalore and Hyderabad. Though these four airports are under control of uh, two private uh, companies, one is GVK and the other is GMR. They are JVs with joint ventures with uh, AAI, with their shareholding of 74 to 26%. Now, within that, uh, there is a rule called Aircraft Rules 1937. These are also very, very old uh, set of rules. They have also been recently amended to deal with the situations that we are seeing since the last five years. Then I also spoke about the authority. This is the regulator, Airports Economic Regulatory Authority of India. Now the role of this regulator is extremely important. So I would like to cover some general concepts here. Because before that is all very 30,000 kind of a discussion that we are having, that these are the statutes which are governing the field. But it is very important for us to know how does an airport work? How does an airline work? When an airport uh, performs its functions at the airport, how are they getting their revenue? Who are they charging from? How much can they charge? So all of this, as far as airport is concerned, is governed by this act called Airports Economic Regulatory Authority of India Act. It defines most of the things as far as airport is concerned. So now, what does the regulator do? The regulator will determine the tariff which will be charged by an airport. Whom will it charge? airport will charge only the airline because that's his consumer. Airlines are consumers of the airport. So how much can he charge the airline is something that will be determined by the regulator. Now, what is it called? What tariff will be determined by the regulator? So the regulator determines something called aeronautical charges. Aeronautical because these are important primary charges which must be charged by the airport for it to survive its regular functions. That's his normal revenue stream. So aeronautical charges would comprise basically landing charges, housing charges, parking charges, and some other charges, miscellaneous charges, which I would not want to cover, just the basic charges. So what are these landing, housing, parking charges? So landing is, you all are aware, when an aircraft lands at an airport, that is the charge that is being levied by the airport 
onto the airline so every airline which is landing at an airport is paying some money to the airport for landing at that airport similarly when an airline decides that i'm going to park my aircraft today here at delhi airport so then there are these charges fixed by this regulator which will be depending on per hour basis so the airline pays that charge third charge is housing charges when i'm housing my aircraft at an airport it could be for one day two day or or for servicing it could be for any purpose so these are charges which are being paid by an airline to the airport simply because i am as an airline utilizing the facility of an airport uh then there are other charges called user development fee and airport development fee these are the charges which are also levied by an airport to the airline but these charges the airline is allowed to pass it on to the passenger those other charges of landing housing parking the airline is not passing it on to the passenger it may indirectly but it is not being shown in your tickets what you will see in your tickets is user development fee and airport development fee so there is a brief difference you will see that probably it sounds similar what is the difference there is a huge difference in how it is being conceptualized by the regulator so user development fee is something which is utilized by an airport operator to run the airport it could be utilized for operations and maintenance of the airport it could be for repair and maintenance of the airport that is it so it is kind of an operational expenditure that an airport incurs the other charge is airport development fee so this development fee is kind of a capital expenditure which would mean it should be only one time expenditure for an airport if today gmr decides to upgrade the delhi uh, delhi airport so the delhi airport is going to incur let's say 1000 crores of rupees and assuming they don't have that kind of fund so they will have option of invoking this airport development fee which is a fee under the aircrafts uh, airports authority of india act so they will levy this but this will be only one time because when you are incurring a capital expenditure you have told uh, the world that i am going to need this 1000 crores to rebuild or to refurbish the airport so therefore i am going to levy this the airlines are going to pay that amount but at the same time they will start showing that airport development fee in the tickets i don't know if you any of you noticed ever in your tickets these charges but these are visible in delhi airport if you are flying out of delhi then you would notice that for your domestic travel you would have paid 200 rupees per passenger if it is international travel you would have paid 600 earlier it was 600 for domestic and 1200 for international two years back it was reduced to uh, 200 and 600 respectively so these are the charges that airport charges the airline and airline charges the passenger so it's a full chain eventually everything is being passed on to the passengers so passengers should be extremely careful and what are the rights and uh, obligations of the passengers as stakeholders in the aviation sector i will be covering that point slightly later so these are important concept whoever is interested in aviation must take into account these last four bullets which are very important for anyone to know now uh, since we spoke about uh, domestic laws and the policies these are policies which have made the indian aviation a success the story started in 1997 where the government came up with this airport infrastructure policy this was after 1991 when the globalization and liberalization happened it took 6 years for ministry of civil aviation to frame this policy immediately after that this naresh chandra committee was appointed it is extremely successful committee in terms of uh, uh, leading the sector where it has reached today then there are several other policies which have uh, been uh, enacted from time to time by the government 
after that 2008 greenfield policy is an interesting policy to read what has happened is earlier the assumption was that most airports are ready to function gradually when naresh chandra committee was working on these aspects they realized that every airport is not ready uh, to be operated so therefore there was a concept of greenfield airports which means there's nothing and you have to start uh, the work from the beginning and in case of brownfield the, there is an airport but it needs refurbishing etc etc so in 2008 for the first time the government came up with greenfield policy uh, greenfield airport policy how do we set up greenfield airport what kind of permissions are required to set up greenfield airport for instance you must have noticed or read in the recent past about jaywar airport in greater noida so what how will that be established what would be the principles that will be governed to what extent will the regulator be relevant for this purpose etc all of this will be covered after 2008 in 2016 there was another policy called national civil aviation policy which changed the paradigm of the aviation sector it introduced viability gap funding for operations it promoted regional connectivity within the country it promised and again promoted the revival of unserved or underserved routes under rcs which is regional connectivity scheme it also gave some incentive to the airport operators to commercially utilize the airport land when airports are able to utilize commercial land properly probably they will be able to reduce the charges we talked about landing housing parking charges when the airport operator has money or the revenue stream is uh, it's a happy revenue stream then the airport operator will be able to give some benefit to the airlines in terms of landing housing parking and in effect the passengers will have to pay less so that's a full circle full spectrum of the payment stream then there are several uh, other policies which have been issued from time to time going on with international conventions which are ratified the most important convention which anybody uses in the country is the second convention which is convention of on international civil aviation 1944 after that is the last one which you will see the convention of international interest in mobile equipment this sounds very technical but in common terms it is known as cape town convention this governs the field this basically says how the aircraft traveling from one country to the other is going to be regulated I don't know if you've heard about the nine freedoms in the aviation sector. Probably I would cover it some other day, not today, because uh, it is an interesting concept. So this is the concept which is covered by the Cape Town Convention. There could be several uh, sectors. Let's say a flight is taking off from Delhi airport. It stops at Singapore for fueling. It is not disembarking passengers there. So there will be a different set of rule which will govern this uh, flight as against some flight which is not only disembarking passengers at Singapore but also traveling onwards to Paris. So then the, uh, the, this airline has three stops. A different set of rules will govern this. So all these are brief, I'm briefly telling you these are called freedoms in, in aviation sector. Freedom number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Total nine freedoms we have. So this governs your aircrafts. Moving on. So here are your main stakeholders in the aviation sector. I don't know if you're able to see the slide properly. Yes, ma'am, proper. Able to see. So, so uh, we have the airlines, we have the airports, we have the passengers, we have the ground and cargo handling. Each of us comprise stakeholders. Each of us are equally important for the aviation sector to be successful. 
even if one is not doing well the others will automatically suffer it's it's a spiraling effect that we will see on each other how they are interconnected and how each will suffer because of the other is in the following slides so you have airlines airlines are not only for passengers there are airlines which are called cargo airlines you now see in this time of covid 19 the passenger airlines are not working only the cargo airlines which is supplying different equipment from one place to the other are working so therefore the category provided under various regulations of passenger versus cargo is absolutely clear there are no restrictions they hardly need any checks and balances when it is about a passenger air, airline there are huge set of rules governing what a pilot should be doing how many hours of sleep he should have done before flying whether he should have consumed alcohol not alcohol proper medical check up that's only for the pilot i'm talking about there are several checks for the crew members safety and security fumigation of the whole uh, plane etc so there are huge checks and compliances which are required to be done before an airline can take off how does one plane achieve the status of an airline there are several permissions which are required to be taken from ministry of home affairs uh, dgca then you have ministry of defense bcas bureau of civil aviation security so several and this takes the whole process takes about 6 months to 1 year for an airline to be successfully flying now coming mostly i've covered airports but briefly i'll say that airports also need license because they will have to demonstrate whether the land acquisition uh, <clears throat> where the airport is going to be operating out of has been properly done whether the airport is going to be located in an area where there is no threat as far as defense services are concerned because it has to have certain distance between an airport and an army area um then there is uh, determination of tariff by the regulator we've covered that if anybody is interested in knowing more about it then there is a lot it can only be one class only on determination of tariff there is so much in it then classification of airports into several segments i started with that you have international airports you have domestic airports you have civil on enclaves you have defense airports airports governed only by aai etc this ground and cargo handling uh, airports are the airports which are neglected the most everybody uh, would have heard about the airports and the airlines but hardly people will know the role that is being played by ground and cargo handlers they are extremely important they are also regulated they also need several permissions before they can become or qualify as ground or cargo handlers so there's a difference between ground and cargo handling i'm covering it in the same breath but they mean different things when you say ground handler ground handler is the staff that you see uh, on the ground when you are checking in when you are uh, going into the aircraft several checks are being conducted that's the ground staff that's the ground handling they are putting your uh, luggage onto the aircraft etc now once this once the uh, luggage is put into the aircraft then the cargo handler which is also a licensed activity their role starts if there is any damage that is caused to the luggage then it is cargo handler's responsibility so therefore you would have noticed when you see some uh, suitcases which are marked as fragile and if there are things let's say glass things which are broken once you land so then it is cargo handler's responsibility to make up for that loss but of course it goes into dispute and then uh, it takes months to resolve it so uh, until 2018 it was not clear whether an airline will be able to do its own ground handling the risk was 
the government thought if airline i can give you an example of um, let's say indigo or let's say spice jet if they as an airline start their own um, get their own employees at ground staff and they manage the staff then the risk was that probably the staff is not going to take the best care which is required by the ground staff so the government thought that i am not going to allow any such activity by their own people so there was full restriction on employing their own ground handling staff in 2018 it was relaxed and uh, the relaxation now says you can get your own people now but what you cannot do is their tests their tests will still be conducted by the government the government will permit them to then work as ground handlers at the airport because eventually it's the airport's responsibility uh, which will be the primary responsibility as far as ground staff is concerned so that's a good change that was brought about in 2018 now as every sector has some challenges here are some of the challenges for each stakeholder we've seen who all are the stakeholders here in aviation sector for as far as airlines is concerned the biggest challenge for an airline is the fuel cost the fuel is called aviation turbine fuel and it is very expensive it is not like our normal petrol and diesel price which is 65 70000 uh, 75 rupees per liter it is in some thousands it is 65000 to 70000 in the range of that it keeps fluctuating obviously it based on uh, global uh, market scenario emergence of substitute in india it's a challenge because now um, the ticket price that is being offered by an airline there are <coughs> the the capacity they are they taking any railway passengers here there is a stiff competition that is being seen there is something called maintenance repair organization so whether maintenance repair can be held in india right now all the air, airlines are going abroad mainly singapore to get their maintenance done maintenance is an exercise which an airline has to undergo every 4 months 6 months to an 8 year and every 5 years there is a huge check so it depends whether you are in 2 year maintenance period or 4 year 4 uh, months because the price varies and it's an it's an extensive amount of uh, money required to maintain and repair the aircraft i am not getting into it because that's a huge uh, topic what are the challenges for the aircrafts now aircraft uh, uh, sorry airports airports are already overutilized that's why you felt the need of jaiwar airport here in great noida delhi airport has already overutilized its capacity when in 2006 it, it was uh, bid out and 2010 when the operation started at the delhi airport the assumption was that probably it will pass 15 years but within 6 7 years it was already almost overutilized so that's a big challenge that we are facing the documents of delhi and bombay uh, airport also provides for a clause which says that within 150 kilometers of an area there cannot be second airport so in case of jaiwar it is within 150 kilometers the uh, condition was relaxed to that extent and therefore you may have this airport very soon in 3 years as they projected i'm not sure with covid whether things will happen on time or not <laughs> similarly for ground and cargo handling every every uh, staff is going to face this issue of huge cost the infrastructure as far as these two are concerned they are paying huge infrastructure cost the moment there is any increase in uh, airports or airlines infrastructure they quickly pass it on to these two uh, providers and hence increase in their cost 
now this is something uh, which is extremely interesting there is dispute resolution what do you do as a consumer when you are stuck at the airport when your luggage is lost that's from consumer's perspective there can be many issues a consumer can face when you are at the airport or when you are traveling by air from an industry perspective what are the competition issues which are being faced by either an airline or by an airport you would have heard of some cases of cartel um, where some airlines were charged that you all are working in tandem one decide one airline decides to hike up the price and all others follow the suit so if that kind of conduct is brought to the fore by anyone you can raise a complaint to cci competition commission of india i can do that any uh, ngo can do that anyone who feels that there is a cartel issue which is being uh, uh, which is uh, which has happened at the industry anybody can raise that so that is what is competition issue covered here and the competition commission has also imposed certain penalties in the past for indulging in this kind of uh, activity there are instances where certain complaints were raised but competition commission found that there is no cartel and no penalty was also imposed in any airline now there is another aspect when there is a dispute between two airlines where do they go when there is a dispute between an airline and an airport where do they go that is the purpose of a regulated sector the regulated sector is going to have clear guidelines for every stakeholder so therefore if it's a dispute between two or more service providers or a dispute between a service provider and a group of consumers then it goes before the appellate authority which is constituted under the era act right now it is td sat that's why you will see that in this slide it's written td sat but it may change with time it is not going to be td sat forever because td sat is only holding a secondary uh, duty as of now under the statute otherwise it could be any other uh, tribunal or it could be an independent tri uh, independent tribunal at a later stage we don't know but as of now it is the appellate authority which will be able to look at these kind of disputes now as for, since you all are students mostly it, this will be important for you to know as lawyers as future lawyers it will make a lot of difference for you to understand how you deal with your rights there are several obligations with it but i am only giving you your rights for now so um, bgca has been coming out with several passengers charter from time to time in the last 2 years they've been very active with respect to consumers rights in february 2 2019 as you can see in this slide they issued passengers charter to address some concerns which were raised by the passengers directly so now passenger can uh, raise uh, complaints directly on some web portal called air seva you can also uh, go to digi yatra and then put in your complaint there are several uh, web pages that are made available by the government of india ministry of civil aviation if you go there you will be able to see it's very easy to maneuver and you will be able to reach the complaint section if there is any you can also give your feedback <coughs> with respect to airlines and airports so now you have your right for asking for refund of the ticket if an airline is delayed beyond 6 hours if the flight is cancelled then also you have a right earlier we used to only hear these things in foreign countries that if a flight is late then i will be entitled to get the entire money back etc so therefore you would notice that everything in the western countries is mostly on time because it's a deterrent it's a punishment to an airline to not fly on time not to reach on time etc so here some of the measures are intended towards that we still haven't uh, 100% applied these in our regular routines but we are proceeding towards that 
that is the objective of this charter if boarding is denied due to overbooking which happens most of the time everybody must have faced this situation so what happens then can you have some uh, refund in that situation you will have some recourse flight diversion loss or damaged baggage right to escalation right to information medical emergency etc so all these rights are been enshrined in these passengers charters which are issued from time to time <clears throat> we briefly discussed about the dispute redress uh, option available to a passenger so first is uh, to make it little uh, light you must have all seen kunal kamra's episode what happened very recently uh, with anup goswami so when a person is impacted or affected by by a conduct like that what do you do so first is you have to uh, complain to the crew that's the first level of complaint after you get off the plane then you have to write to the concerned airline notary officer <clears throat> and you have a right to ask the airline who is your notary officer and they are required to tell you that you lodge a formal complaint and if it is unresolved then you can always take it up with the appellate authority of the concerned airline of course you can always say that if it is the same airline person who's sitting on my complaint i'm not going to get any relief but you can't lose hope because an airline uh, person is sitting there we have to follow the process as lawyers we would need to know the process and follow it then there is a dgca as i said sugam.dgca is another portal that you can raise your grievance dgca is very very active in all kinds of complaints these days then you have another grievance uh, forum which is under a complaint under consumer protection act for deficiency of services this is actually a recourse available to passengers but it's a tough one for a passenger to prove it for deficiency of services it's very subjective so it may take you time effort cost to maintain that claim for deficiency of services but once you know what service is deficient then definitely you must go ahead and file it then another portal is complaint at air seva which i mentioned for all the passengers available this protection of information provided by the consumer that is available to all the passengers traveling you have the uh, you have the uh, right under the right to information act you can write to aai dgca ministry of civil aviation and ask about the operations of the airports mainly you may not be able to ask about the airline because airline is not under any government control except air india so uh, now after knowing what are the passengers right that i felt was the interesting part as far as the students are concerned there are these notable developments that have taken place in our country and the government has been extremely positive with respect to the sector i will briefly touch upon this because these may be little technical points and may need further uh, dwelling into it so fdi foreign direct investment has been relaxed for the airline sector 100% is allowed now how do you get 100% foreign uh, money is subject to automatic route subject to certain approvals from rbi so if uh, anybody asks you whether a foreign investor can get 100% ownership in indian airline the answer is yes but how do you do it it still needs certain checks and approvals from the government similarly from the airport's perspective yes a foreign investor can buy 100% of the airport greenfield and brownfield both as far as airports are concerned the regulatory checks are not so much when it is about foreign direct investment then we also spoke about the policies from time to time 
how it has helped the sector, how the government is looking at the statutes, how they are amending the statutes from time to time to make it more, not only consumer friendly, but also looking at the interests of the airlines and the airports, because those are the real stakeholders. If they don't survive, there will not be any uh, viability for the sector. So one important aspect that I would like to highlight is you noticed that the regulator and the statute were brought about by the government in 2008, exactly after 10 years, we got our first judgment by the appellate authority in Delhi, Delhi airport case. So it took 10 years for anyone to reach one decision. And now that decision is the landmark decision, which tells us how aeronautical charges of an airport are determined. What are the factors that must be considered by the regulator? Of course, this judgment is um, appealed by the airport and it's pending in Supreme Court right now. God only knows when it will be taken up, but that's the position as of now. Another, another point is uh, Udan. Everybody must have heard about it. Uday Desh Ka Aam Nagrik. That has proved to be a very successful scheme because it has connected the regional, several regions of the country very successfully. It has made it extremely viable for the passengers to travel from one part of the country to the other. The government is able to utilize it very well. And, and also the feedback from uh, the stakeholders has been very, very encouraging. These are several uh, trends that are doing the rounds here. Government since April 2020 now, after COVID, has been very active in handling the situation. They are primarily allowing only cargo flights, which are helping the country from taking these equipment and food supplies from one place to the other. Air India, not to mention, not to forget, that Air India has played a crucial role in evacuating these nationals which were stranded due to the pandemic across the world. The financing issues, many issues which are pending resolution. Now briefly I would like to touch upon how has COVID-19 impacted the aviation sector. This is one of the worst affected uh, sectors in the country. The flights are down by more than 85%. Whether it's a low cost carrier or a full service carrier, everybody is impacted hugely by that. There is a consultant of uh, aviation sector who's said that the aviation industry is going to look at the loss of $3.6 billion. Almost 150 aircrafts are uh, grounded. So right now, what we are looking at as all stakeholders is survival before growth. Earlier, we were talking about growth, but what COVID has taught us is survival. Let's survive first, then we will figure out the growth. India has still not come out with any financial package for the industry, unlike other countries of US, Singapore, Sweden, Norway, etc. We've also covered briefly what is the implication. Maybe there will be phased opening of markets in different countries, different cities, different states. We will only have to wait and watch. Domestic operations may open sooner than international uh, operations, but I think the travel restrictions will still be there unless extremely important the travelers would like to avoid the international travel. What we should be doing as a country is several suggestions that we have, but not really necessary because eventually it is about, as I said, it is about survival. For survival, you need financial packages. Unless we are able to take care of the finances and the revenue streams, we will not be able to sustain the 
uh, sector. So these are the options. In case anybody is keen on knowing how do we achieve this, you're most welcome. But I think we are running out of time. And uh, I would like to conclude it here. These were some of the important parameters which are important from uh, aviation perspective. There is much more to be covered when you talk about aviation sector. There is much more to cover in airlines. How does the leasing of an airline uh, function? How does financing of an airline take place, etc. So these are huge subjects. This can't be covered in an hour. So there is a need to do it repeatedly. So therefore your college is doing a great job by providing you the platform of covering various regulated areas from time to time. I believe there are several uh, sessions on electricity, energy, competition, etc. So utilize the platform. This should help you gain knowledge in several areas and uh, we should be thankful to the college for providing such excellent facilities. With that, I would like to for hearing me for this time. Thanks so much. Thank you so very much, ma'am, for your time today uh, in this session. Uh, I am so thankful to you, and I am so thankful to all the participants over here who are who participated in today's session. And just to make two announcements, quick announcements before we take up few questions, which are. Uh, raised by some students over here. And that is subject to uh, the time if ma'am will have. We will be able to, she will be able to give time if, uh, to few of the questions. Just two quick announcements. One is that we are looking to start an aviation certificate course in our college with the uh, help and support from uh, uh, Unam ma'am. And also, uh, uh, all those students who are who are in our college in any of the batch they may take this facility even the passing out batch can take the facility of joining us in the in this particular certificate course uh, along with that uh, next week again i mean uh, on 29th uh, we have a session uh, with ma'am which is on energy loss and that that day ma'am will be talking about electricity or other energy sectors and we will announce uh, with respect to energy law certificate course over there. And uh, it is up to ma'am. If a uh, few questions from the students, uh, can we take ma'am? Or we have to end the session? Yeah, sure, sure. I have time till 5.15. Ma'am, uh, if you will click on the chat box, there are a few questions that will open up in a pop-up chat at the bottom. Chat box. Can you click on the chat? I am not able to see any chat box here. At the, uh, I can, I can now probably see it. Please click that and a box will open. Yeah, I can see the questions also. Yeah. You can... Uh, Do you want me to read it? Ma'am, you can unshare the PPT and then you can answer the questions. Okay. Stop, stop sharing. No, I'll have to figure that out. There's too much to do. <laughs> stop sharing a uh, green green wala na bottom mein jo tha share stop share stop share stop share yeah yeah now uh, there are questions which you can uh, read in the chat box and i think there are four or five questions which we can take up so there is an interesting question uh, shubham manchani has raised he says that, are the parking charges still being levied by the airport in the period of COVID? If yes, is it possible to pursue a litigation claiming not to levy such parking charges? So Shubham, I would like to tell you that there was a representation made by the airports to the uh, BGCA with a copy to Ministry of Civil Aviation, where they said that landing, housing and parking charges must be increased in this time because Otherwise, they're not able to sustain uh, the airport. The representation has obviously not been entertained. Forget the increase. If airlines are able to pay the existing charges, that will be too much for them to pay because how are airlines going to get money because they are also not flying. So therefore, in order to create that balance, 
therefore now today the government is looking at creating that balance if they come up with this financial package then the some kind of money will go to airports and some will go to the airlines so that both can sustain each other second is you saying that whether there is a litigation possible yes litigation is possible for everything so if you have to challenge this act of charging the parking fees yes definitely there is a way out you can take it up in litigation there is a question by ritum uh, on i just saw where you mentioned that aircraft act governed the aircraft flying within the indian territory how was the international airlines governed so aircraft act had two streams so there were several uh, separate segments which, which governed the international flights and separate segments which governed the in indian domestic flights so therefore from 1934 that was the rule which was followed of course there were certain uh, amendments from time to time therefore there was a need to merge the two international and domestic and the government came out with this airports authority of india act of 1994 so if you read 1994 the statement of objects and reasons you will specifically see it's a four page it's a four paragraph statement of objects in the second and third para you will clearly get your answer the objective of this statute is to merge international and uh, indian and have one authority to deal with these aircrafts i hope that answers your question uh somebody says are they greenfield airports which I, i don't see if there is any mention of which airport yeah so greenfield airports are the airports which are built from scratch yes ma'am there is a question by simran under the case of crash or accidents on airport who is it that actually bears the loss whether it is the airline both the loss is to be born if it's a crash so there are two things that you must uh, keep in mind the crash is not caused by anybody's negligence so therefore when you travel there is always an option of tra taking travel insurance as a passenger that is your uh, protection that you must get as a passenger once you have that you will be able to uh, if you if you survive if we survive then of course we have uh, the insurance if we don't then the families can definitely sue the airline to a greater extent airport to a lesser extent airports liability will arise only when there is a lapse at the airport's front if an airline is crashing in uh, in some garden or in some sea so then it is nobody's responsibility then the air airport operator is not liable at all but if while landing the road the track was not smooth enough or if there was a cow if there is a bird which has hit the plane then it is the airport's responsibility also so then in that case it's a joint responsibility otherwise airline's responsibility there is a question by uh, barun devri how does an airline deals with the paying of compensation and damages when an aircraft goes missing so we are still in 370 mh yeah very interesting question see the airline is missing some of the staff is already there i am not sure whether they are looking at paying any compensation to anyone because i one not sure whether the uh, whether the families are coming forward to claim any compensation or not even if they are they are entitled to get compensation they would be paid however they book the tickets if they booked it by uh, credit card it should be refunded by that if it's by cash etc so they have a right to get compensation whether they've got it or not is not to my knowledge there is again a question by ritum about yeah yeah of course uh, so the question is whether there have been instances of violations under section 4 of competition act abusing uh, dominant position yes so uh, two things have happened one uh, air india there was a case where air india 
was considered a dominant position that was long time back but indigo took over that market share when they were about 47% of the market share so there was a case filed against them that they are now controlling it and hence they form part of cartel where competition commission said no sorry there is no cartel everybody is doing their independent analysis and reaching a number or the price of the ticket which is to be charged from a passenger so there have been instances another instance that happened was um, i think it was uh, for the airport when gmr it was in the case of gmr but it never saw the light of the day because it was eventually withdrawn there is another question by mr shubham mishra uh, yeah reference to udan scheme where the government is providing subsidy to the airline company for utilization of small airport whether the landing charge yes so the answer to this is yes uh, under the whole purpose of udan scheme is to make the operations for the airline viable because if there is a limit under udan if i am flying from uh, Delhi to Siliguri, and the price ticket, the cap is twenty four hundred rupees only. The flight is not going to make any money, no profit at all in twenty four hundred. So therefore, as an airline, one can charge twenty four hundred, but the ticket price ideally should be let's say five thousand. So that gap is made up by the government. so in that sense government is taking care of that uh, deficit that delta that is you may call it subsidy in government's language in the policy it is called viability gap funding so therefore the government is taking an, into account that gap and making that gap viable by funding that uh, delta there are too many too many questions more there is a question by suride ranjan Sorry, who is that? To the Ranjan. To the Ranjan. How should we take the current act of airline companies where they are creating traditional in lieu of returning passengers money? Uh, okay, so uh, I don't know if uh, Shrude has actually faced it, but the policy is that you can opt for cancellation. You can opt for refund. If you're opting for refund, then of course. as i understand that it's a credit shall being created so uh, if you booked it through your credit card the money is supposed to come back to your credit card otherwise they will give you some slots they will say that you can utilize this ticket in next month or next month or whenever the flights are operating it is up to you to choose that option they can't force that option on you so if they have done that please raise a complaint against it and you should be uh, taken care of there is another question by sagar rawat yeah why there was lack of initiative on the part of government in case of jet airways bringing its curtains down and halting its operations in terms of financing of funding the airline when doors actually closed from the side of private lenders and what remedy do jet employees have who are left completely the unemployed though i agree it was management failure so uh, sagar you actually answered the question in your last sentence <laughs> so see what has happened here interesting question and everybody has been thinking about it why jet has failed it was such a successful airline so why did government not support i am not the right person to answer it they had written several representations to the government whether government did anything or not i am not in a position to respond to this and uh, whether any funding was asked or not given by the government i am sure funding was asked whether not given is known to all of us it was not given that's why the airline has failed now the airline is uh, bankrupt it is before uh, nclt bombay the proceedings are on they are not or the country is not able to find any uh bidders for the airline which is quite uh, disappointing 
we'll have to see how it, how this pans out because it's very difficult for me to really project as to what will happen to jet second part of your question is what remedy do these employees have these employees have several recourses they can go to court they can write to dgc they can write to moka they can do things but the reality is when a passenger uh, when an employee is taking an action he or she must be aware of the situation if a person is not being paid by jet that person becomes an operational creditor under ibc mm-hmm. so if that every employee is a operational creditor as on date they have a right to file a claim in uh, nclt bombay under ibc code whether they get any money out of it or not is a million dollar question because operational creditors are last in the list they may not actually get anything but there is a recourse available to my mind if you ask me whether they will get anything or not the answer if i see it right will not they will not get anything tough luck but that's how the law is right now the last question is by gorav kumar can aviation law cover more than just accidents or injuries that occurred while in flight sorry can aviation law cover more than just accidents of course of course it's, it's by no stretch limited to the flights what happens inside the flight is only one aspect to it what happens outside the flight is another aspect what happens at the airport off the airport at the ground uh, when you are in cargo area what happens so it is huge it is massive how these things happen how everything is linked to each other so when we as passengers go to the airport it seems so seamless the whole transaction the whole experience seems seamless but to make it seamless all these uh, bodies are working very hard to give us that experience and therefore to answer your question it has much more than just what happens in the flight hey, ritum so we've just made in time it's 5:15 yes ma'am ritum please thank you so much ma'am for such an insightful session we look forward to having you once again uh, on the following week uh, with another session thanks a lot ma'am thank you ritum it was thank you, ma'am for such a nice thank session you. we are so thankful to your time and your uh, presence here today for our students hope to see you more often to, uh, for our students and uh, for uh, better sessions and and good knowledge uh, imparted to us thank you so very much ma'am thank you dr selim thank you very much have a good day ma'am have a good day keep safe thank, thank you, you take care bye bye i'm i'm ending the session now thank you